He was trained as an electrical engineer, decided on a showbiz career while at Queen's College, Oxford. He paved the way for a new British television comedy, not the nine o'clock news, Blackadder, Mr. Bean. He's received numerous international prizes for his outstanding works, and he's known to be extremely selective about public appearances, and talk shows tops his list of things to avoid. Please welcome the man behind the mask, Rowan Atkinson. Uh, Rowan, I, I start with the most horrifying thing to do. I start with a quote that uh, I read oh, dear. from you. It says, the problem with talk shows is that you're supposed to amuse. I generally rely on being interesting rather than funny. They, that is us here, are not actually very interested in people who are very interesting. They just want people with wacky stories about airports, and I haven't really got any. <laughs> How true. It, it's true. How true. I haven't. So how was Castro Bearport? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have no stories. No. <laughs> but how do you explain the, the man in the mask, the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde? Mm. Well, I don't know, really. I suppose it's just a job, you know, that's mm. all. It's just a... It's, uh, I suppose that I'm just an actor, probably, at, at heart, rather than a comedian. Mm. I'm, I'm always rather confused, as I think I know you are about whether I'm a comedian or whether I'm an actor. No, you know, or whether no I'm, I'm an not actor. confused at You're not confused no. at all? Oh, well, I'll stop talking. I know you're boring now, and I know I, you exactly. will consider... <laughs> no. Exactly. You'll be not, <laughs> nodding off in no time. Um, uh, I, I, I do draw a pretty sharp line mm -hmm. between the two, which is why interviews like this are generally quite rare things, because I think generally that people want you to be funny, so I try not to be unfunny, mm -hmm. but, but I try to make up for my lack of funniness within myself mm. uh, by hopefully trying to be you know vaguely intelligent and interesting about it I can be funny I think mm. as myself when I'm with very good friends in small rooms mm. um, and and I'm very relaxed well but as soon as I'm in a big it's just studio, the two of us here and, so. <laughs> and, all, <laughs> and all those yeah. millions of, all those people out there no but it, it, uh, it strikes me that Richard Curtis says that uh, you find almost nothing funny I, I, yeah I'm not. Oh, I'm not I a good. Got you there. Yes, yes, I almost laughed, didn't I? <laughs> but not quite. No, I. I find it difficult to laugh at other things. Mm. Very, very few people and very few situations make me laugh. I. I sometimes feel some of it is in the back of me where I'm. I'm analysing the humour or I'm analysing the joke rather than enjoying it. Mm. So somebody tells a very good joke and I go, hmm. <laughs> Very funny. And they stop telling jokes. <laughs> and, they so, and they stop telling jokes. But I'm thinking about, yes, I suppose it is funny. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm kind of, it's sort of clocking, it's sort of slowly mm. filtering its way down through the system. And, um, and sometimes I laugh a long time afterwards when I suddenly realise how, how well structured the joke was and mm. how, how beautifully told it was. And then I can laugh at it. And I, then people I, look at, it, at you if you were some... Yes, many, many hours later. As if I'm a madman. Mm. I think, I mean, generally, I, I enjoy the performance mm. more than the joke. I usually enjoy the performer and his attitude. You know, it's the attitude with which humour is told which I enjoy mm. so much. In other words, generally, the things that make me laugh are characters. You know, it's people who kind of present a sort of truth to you. I mean, even though it's mad or it's funny or it's wacky or it's rude or it's, or it's silly, but there's a sort of a truth there that you identify with and you think... I know that situation, I've been there, or I've seen someone like that mm. on the train, or I am someone like that, and I, uh, and I prefer to keep it hidden. And yet here, here I am being uh, characterised extremely well. Mm. And, 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 that's, and that does make me laugh. So dramatic sometimes. situations rather than jokes. Yes, 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 yes exactly. How, how, would you, uh, how would you describe Mr Bean? Uh, I mean, I... I wondered about the name, uh, bean, has been, a vegetable, no? Mm -mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. We started with, uh, you know, zucchini. And, uh, <laughs> um, and Mr. Zucchini. Mr. Zucchini. Yeah. Or, or, or 
Mr. Potato or, or, <laughs> Mr., or Mr. Cauliflower or Mr. Cabbage or, you know, Mr. And then we just sort of thought, Bean. Bean, you know, seems it's short and it's silly. And, and we, we, we were, yeah, it was either that or the name of a bird, you know, you know Mr. Wren or Mr. Chaffinch. But, um, you know, birds and vegetables tend to be the funniest names, mm. they say. Birds and vegetables. Um, so, I, uh, so we homed in on Bean, yeah. Okay, obviously there is a homage to um, Jacques Tati's Monsieur Hulot. Yes. Yes, yes, there was. I mean, it, and, and it's quite real. I mean, I, I don't think Mr. Bean is anything like Monsieur Hulot. No. I think he is quite different. But at the same time, there are similarities. And it's something about the comedy of, of not much happening, of nothing happening. The first Mr. Bean sketch that Richard Curtis and I ever wrote was, um, well, from what that, fa that falling asleep joke came from it, from the church mm. sketch, which was in the very, very first, yes, I Mr. Bean, when he can't stay awake in the church and the sermon is droning on and he can't, you know, he can't, he can't stay awake. Um, and, and in theory, n nothing's happening. Mm. I mean, when you explain the joke to people, you know, we had this one line, man can't stay awake. That, that was the script. And it takes ten minutes. Uh, and it takes ten minutes. <laughs> right. and, you, and you read it and you think, well, I don't know, you know, it might be funny, but what's funny about it? And, and what's funny is the sort of truth of it, is the fact that you can see yourself there and you think, yes, actually, you know, if I was slightly less self-conscious and slightly less aware of myself, if I had slightly less self-control... Um, then I would be like Mr. Bean, and I too would be on my head on the floor with my feet in the air. <laughs> and you can sort of, uh, and you identify with it, but it's, it's sort of the comedy of nothing happening. I mm. mean, there aren't, you know, fire engines or police cars or men rushing in the door or women with underwear around their ankles. It's all, you know, it's very kind of uneventful. Um, it's very ordinary, very b basic sort of stuff, like the man making the sandwich. Mm. Must have been making the sandwich in the park. That you sort of say, well, that's per you know, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, but he does it in a very eccentric way, <laughs> and you think, no, 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 that's not. And yet, you know, if you were in that situation, you might do something similar, but mm. you'd stop yourself. <clears throat> well, well, I would. Cheers. Mm. Cheers. You're good health. Um. But if we compare Monsieur Hulot and Mr. Bean, yeah. there's a difference in, char in psychology as well. Yes, there is. Well, I mean, Mr. Bean is nastier. Yeah, Mr. Yeah, Bean is quite so. a nasty man. Why? He's quite, well, because if he has any morals, if he has any values, then, then they're, they're the morals of a nine-year-old boy. Hmm. That's how I always see him. If anyone wants to ask a question about Mr. Bean, you know, what, what would he do if this happened? You know, what sort of car does he drive? What, what does he dream about? Um, I would say, what does a nine-year-old boy think about? Mm. And then I say, oh, that's what he'd think about. And, of course, towards women, for instance, he's, yeah, you know, he, he sort of yeah. r romanticizes them, you know. They're sort of mother figures, mm. I suppose, more mm -hmm. than... But the idea of a relationship or a sexual relationship, and you know, that is just not part of his makeup at all. He, it just wouldn't never enter his brain. No. I mean, you must presume that he knows nothing about it. You must presume that. No, but the, the good thing about nine-year-old nine nine, uh, year kids are yeah. that they have parents to yes. kind of control them. Yes. Mr. Bean is yeah. totally... He's an orphan. Uh, yes, he's an orphan. He, he's a child without yeah. parents. Yes. And, of course, we haven't given him parents. We haven't given him any family. Mm. He has no friends. No, it just comes from above. He's just a sad. He's a poor, oh, poor yeah, that's man. A, yeah, we all feel. But he makes, he makes me laugh. He really <clears> does. He, I mean, of all the people that I've, I've played or, or tried to create, there's something about him that gets to me, that, mm. that sometimes I can, when we're rehearsing or when we're trying to write and we're thinking of situations, and you think, yes, that's just what Mr. Bean would do, and, he, and it, it makes me laugh. But it's funny, the more alien, the more malicious, the more cowardish he is, the more we laugh, maybe mm. from fear, I don't know. Mm. We asked one of the, the more well-known Bean watchers to give his opinion. Ooh. You can see it on the screen here. I think it's very clever in as much that it translates worldwide because of the uh, lack of dialogue. I mean, in much the same way that Benny Hill uh, translated worldwide. But I think because, maybe because of that, um, there's reductionism in the terms of the comedy. It becomes a very simplistic form of comedy because it, if it's just a visual gag, you have to be not too sophisticated to devise visual gags that, that are going to work th throughout the world. 
set. David Bowie that we met in London last week. How flattering. Yes. Um, uh, but do you agree with him that a silent character has certain li limitations? That well, yes, generally visual comedy, because it's so accessible, because it's so obvious, really, it's so simple, which is why, you know, children from the age of three can enjoy Mr. Bean. Mm. And uh, people aged 85 and 100 can enjoy Mr. Bean. It, it, it appeals across a very broad age range, uh, but particularly to the very young, because it's so simple, it's so manifest. There are no words, and there are no literary references. There's, there's nothing subtle about it, I, I'm afraid, in the end. And that is the limitation. Mm. In the end, the particularly, you know, if we live as we do in an educated society, you know, we read books and we enjoy words and we enjoy word play and we enjoy literature, then I know a lot of people, for instance, who like the Black Adder, mm. which was full of words and full of silliness and, and metaphor and great long, ridiculous, uh, eloquent Dialogue. expressions of simile and all sorts of, you know, complicated English, mm. basically, complicated words, that they don't like Mr. Bean. They find it too simplistic, as, as David Bowie used the right word. Simplistic it is. And mm. that's the limitation. And in the end, I feel as though you can get a bit sick of it. I mean, you, you can enjoy it. I haven't got sick of it yet, because oh. he, he, he amuses me. And he makes me laugh. Even before Blackadder, before uh, Mr. Bean, uh, you popped up of the, the British Review with yes. a, a, as an artist who had almost entire... Uh, artistic control. I have, a, I have a small clip I'm going to show you uh, where you, with almost no words, get the grasp of the audience. It's uh, a bit from the schoolmaster sketch. Oh, right. Nancy Boy Potter. <laughs> Nibble. Orifice. <laughs> Plectrum. <laughs> Poins. Sediment. <laughs> Soda. <laughs> Ta. Ta. <laughs> Under manager. <laughs> Zob. <laughs> Absent. from this uh, secret policeman's call for the benefit of Amnesty International. Mm -hmm. uh, and with this kind of material, you kind of set the example of a new British comedy. They talked about the new John Cleese, the new Benny Hill. Was it difficult to be a comedian in that post-Python period? Um, yes, it was. Um, we were constantly... Yes, because Python was at its height when, well, when I was at university, when I was at college, and they were the heroes, and I started working, you know, on Not the Nine O'Clock News and The Black Adder within five seven years of that time and it was difficult because it's like the shadow hanging over you and that's actually that's why the black adder was set in the 15th century because we were so aware of faulty towers mm. which was the other thing that was going on just before we did the black adder we thought how are we going to make a program which is not compared unfavorably to faulty towers and so we thought well at least if we set it in the, in the 15th century they, they can't possibly surely draw any parallels with a hotel on the south coast of England in, in, in 1975 um, and I don't think they did they hated it for other reasons but they didn't compare us unfavorably <laughs> with faulty towers start, yeah. but, but, it, but it was and not nine o'clock news luckily was very different from Monty Python I mean completely different M Monty Python was very wacky and very surreal totally absurd mm. and really not the o'clock news was something else not the o'clock news was about reality it was about kind of more about r real performances and hopefully you know a bit more sort of real characterization and parodying real television and television news of the time um, on not the nine o'clock news it was mel smith yourself 
and uh, Griff Rhys Jones, yes. Pamela Stevenson, who did that. We stopped Griff Rhys Jones in London to ask did him, you? yes, just to give us a comment on you, because he knows you. He, Rowan is an extraordinary comedian, because just, uh, you know, every time you go and see somebody else, a comedian, on stage, you always think, um, well, I wish I had his act. Well, that's a good idea. I wonder if I could pinch that. Or, um, yes, that's uh, a remarkable uh, thing. I, I, I can use that. I could probably develop that. With Rowan, when you watch him, particularly on stage, you think, that's absolutely extraordinary. How, you know, that's so unique that you have no, there's, sometimes it defies a sort of sense of analysis. And all I feel when I watch him is that he, I could never do that. That his style of performing is so, so unique and extraordinary that there's no, it's inimitable and therefore very, uh, uh, very precious in a sense to watch. Um, and I didn't really mean that as a criticism. I only mean that when he does something like uh, the schoolmaster monologue, which re relies upon five names and a great deal of inner presence in order to maintain the structure of the, and the performance, that's a very different form of comedy from the sort that I feel comfortable doing, which is very loose. I mean, I'd sort of a messy comedian, if you like, and he's an enormously precise comedian. And that's uh, a, a wonderful skill. Well... Nice work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how, how did a messy comedian from Cambridge and a perfectionist like yourself from Oxford mm. happen to work together? The BBC <laughs> are very good. <laughs> the BBC are very good at bringing people from very diverse backgrounds with diverse attitudes mm -hmm. together. Um, and it was one of those things that was got together by the producer, John Lloyd, who, who I've worked with a great deal since he produced the Black Adder also and he just chose from what I gather four people the four of us to do things together and we were and the great thing about a team I'm, I'm so glad I did it I was going to do a program by myself at first at, at another yes. te television station and I made one program um, in which I played three different characters and and that's what I was going to do as a series just me you know the Rowan Atkinson show yeah it looks um, nice <laughs> and I was only and I was very scared about the Rowan, of the Rowan Atkinson show it didn't seem to me to be the right thing to do at that time um, and I thought I'd much rather do something in which I'm just a little bit more in the background in which we can share the team share way. the responsibility yes. the team way Mm -hmm. share the responsibility and if it's good you all take take the credit and if it's bad you say it was him <laughs> he was bad I was fine when you did not TV was the target also the TV interview mm -hmm. was do you mind if I call you Elton no no it's fine good well Elton <laughs> I'm sure the first question that, ev that everybody would like to ask you is this funny name Elton <laughs> How did you come by it? Well, I used to be in a band, and uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to become a singer in my own right, and I, I wanted to choose a name, and the saxophone player in the band was called Elton, so I chose that name. Mm -hmm. Did you ever consider John Elton? <laughs> no. You, you didn't? No. Okay. <laughs> right, well, let's start with those early albums, then. One of which, I believe, was called simply Elton John. Yes, that's correct. And you didn't feel awkward with the name at all? <laughs> no. You didn't feel that people might say, wait a minute, they mean John Elton. <laughs> uh, they've cocked up the record sleeve and printed the bloody name the wrong way around. <laughs> you didn't think that. No, I thought it sounded great, and, you know... I I thought people would be more interested in the music rather than the name. Hmm. <laughs> now, to the songs themselves, many of the lyrics were, of course, written by Bernie Taupin. Yes, that's right. Yes. But I'd like to talk about Bernie for a while, since obviously he's been an enormous influence on your career. Yes, he has, yes. Tell me, did you ever discuss changing his name? <laughs> Because presumably, Torpin Bernie would have been more consistent with your Elton John. Look, do you want to talk about the old songs or not? 
All right, all right, the songs. <laughs> the old songs. Your song is a classic, isn't it? Yeah, it's quite popular, yes. Well, there is a verse in that song in which, talking about the eyes of the person that the song is about, you sing, Excuse me for asking, these things I do. You see, I've forgotten if they're green or they're blue. <laughs> yes. What I'd like to know is this. Is it this sort of chronic forgetfulness <laughs> that led you to forget that Elton is not, in fact, a Christian name at all? It is a surname. And, uh, and not a very attractive one at that. Well, I had some questions to ask him. And, um, Relevant and, ones? And he found it difficult to answer them. <laughs> yeah, he did, of That's course he did. That's all I can say. <laughs> Uh, where, where will mi Mr. Bean's escapades end, do you think? <sighs> You're not tired of him We yet. had an idea, but... Should I tell you what the idea yes, is? Yes, please do. No, I don't know. Okay. Yes, all right, yes, I will. Um, it was this idea for the last, which we may never do, mm -hmm. the last episode of, of Mr. Bean, is that he's driving along a country lane extremely fast in his Mini, and he sees this spaceship landing <laughs> in a field, and he stops the car, <laughs> and he looks out and he thinks, what's, what's that spaceship doing there? And he drives into the field with his men and he stops outside the spaceship. <laughs> and he looks around and he looks up and suddenly the door goes... <laughs> uh, and this bright light comes out of the spaceship. And a Mr. Bean walks out of the spaceship. Of course. <laughs> and then another Mr. Bean walks out of the spaceship. <laughs> And he sees Mr. Bean and they all shake hands. <laughs> Mr. Bean says, hello, hello, how are you? And then 25 more Mr. Beans all come out of the spaceship and they all pat him on the back and say, you know, very nice to see you. And then all the Mr. Beans go up into the spaceship and he shakes hands with the captain and the, and the, and the guy on the bridge. Um, and then the door goes up and, and the, and the, and, and and the spaceship takes off. And that's the end of Mr. Bean. So uh, thereby kind of... But we may do it. Mm -hmm. We may do it. It's, it's a kind of silly idea. I mean, there is this idea that he may not be of our world. He may be from another place. I, I believe he is. Then, then, then I won't have to ask you about the future of British comedy. What, because I'll be gone? Yes, you will. <laughs> so you, you wouldn't be able to answer that. No, I'll be out I'm, of there. I'm going to ask you uh, five quick ones. Oh, that's me. The nasty part, <laughs> yes. Um, Do I win any money if I get them all? Right? No, you still owe me five pounds. Oh, yeah. Um, I know that you hate... You know, I hate... What was that? I being asked that. five questions. I was, okay. I, was, I was just a face. Just, you have a lot of faces. Nothing exciting. Okay. Which of your many faces are your favourite one? Um, probably one of Mr Bean's. Um, just that sort of... <laughs> sort of lost. Okay. Somebody lost. That amuses me. Is that because you feel mostly connected to that? I feeling feel, of being I lost? I feel for him. Yes, I do feel for him. Mm -hmm. I feel for his loneliness. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are you a loner? Is that the second question or, or a follow-up to number one? <laughs> Am I a loner? No, I, I like being alone for some of the time, but most of the time I enjoy being with people I love. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's nice. <laughs> I'm asking you because I'm, I'm aware that um, you're very protective about your private life. And yes. I, won't, I, won't, I won't go into that much. Uh, but I, I know that your other passion, besides that of acting, yes. is cars. Yes, yes. I do have a great interest in motor cars and mot motorsport. Mm -hmm. Yep. Motor racing. Why cars? You even write I about cars? I don't know. I write about them, yeah, for, for a, a monthly magazine in, in England. I don't know. There's, I've always loved them. I think it's being a farmer's son that I was, that somehow you grow up with machinery and tractors and combine harvesters and, and on the land, and there's, and there's something about machinery that I've just always enjoyed. And, and there's something... There's a, it's a great release driving. Action. But if you yourself was a car, were a car, what kind of car would that be? If I were a car, yes. what kind of car You did car a sketch one where, where it was called Mr. Car Park, I remember. Yes, so. yes. Oh, dear me, what kind of car would I be? But don't, don't go into that. I'd be, um... <laughs> Morris? <laughs> no, I'd be... Uh, I think I'd be quite a discreet car. 
Aston Martin? Not to... Yeah, I mean, Aston Martins are cars that... I've had a few, mm. uh, as you know. Cars. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I... And I've, I've tended to come back to Aston Martins because they are sort of discreet, but they're very English. Mm. They're very fast. <laughs> which I'm not. <laughs> uh, uh, but there's some... Yeah, they're, yes, an Aston Martin or a Lancia. An mm. Italian car called mm -hmm. Lancia. I, I enjoy them. Well... The fast ones. The fast ones. <laughs> Not the slow ones. You don't drive too fast, do you? Not too fast, oh. no. <laughs> no, just fast enough. That's how fast okay. I drive. Then, OK, if you were a car, where would you park? These are very difficult questions, yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you. Yes, Here, but I'm, um, I'm, I'm in trying a car to... park, uh, I, I, I park in a garage. Oh, you do? I'd stay off the street. Mm. Yes, I'd want to be in a garage at night. Mm. Mm. Protect it. Protected, yes, exactly. And out of the public gaze. Mm. Mm. The reason why I ask is, of course, you've toyed with the idea of uh, acting in Los Angeles. You played a part in Hot Shots too. Yes. I was wondering, maybe you would park your talent in Hollywood for a while. Park my talent in Hollywood? Mm. Well, that's... For them to exploit. Well, that's not the equivalent of parking in a garage. That's the equivalent of no. parking in the middle of an airfield with bright lights on you from all sides. <laughs> that's the equivalent of that. Yeah, but so, you park uh, privately in a park, garage. Park but, uh, and then run out <laughs> in the middle of the airfield and then... <laughs> run, Professionally. Run, run back into the garage again. Hollywood is a very, very difficult place to be, as, as I'm sure you know, particularly for a foreign, foreign artist. I mean, foreign to America i.e. all of us, um, that the, it, it is a very difficult place to act because they, you know, they've got their own agenda and their own way of making films and their own ideas about how you should be packaged and what you can do. And something I suppose I've grown to believe in over the years is in my own instinct. Mm. And I think I know, you know best what I can do. It's, I'm very difficult to fit in to the Hollywood jigsaw. Yeah. I'm a very awkward shape. <laughs> Have a nice, fun crash. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.